Welcome listeners to the 12th episode of the Ubered podcast. I'm your host, Evan Kale. For four years, I was a full-time Uber and Lyft driver in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I gave more than 8,000 rides during that time period, and I wrote two books on the subject. Ubered, My Life as a Rideshare Driver, and Ubered 2, both available on Amazon. Listeners, as I'm sure many of you can imagine, being an Uber driver and a Lyft driver is gross. And the big reason is, as I mentioned in the previous episode, gross. When there's huge amounts of people getting in and out of a space... They kind of tend to see themselves as being anonymous. The mentality is, I'm just one body, but there are so many other bodies coming and going, what's to distinguish me from the rest? And so, as a result, a lot of my passengers exhibited some terrible hygiene. Others treated my car like a motel room. Oftentimes people puked, or I was privy to a number of other disgusting human bodily functions. Enough so that I documented so many stories that this episode is Gross Part 2. As some of you may remember, I've already done one episode called Gross, but I had so many disgusting stories that I couldn't possibly fit them all into one episode. So if you were expecting something of a more intriguing nature this week, I'm sorry to disappoint. Most of these are just, like, if you're eating your lunch right now, just like Gross Part 1, you should probably finish up now, because it's, it's not a pretty... Not going to be a pretty block of time here, folks. So let's start by talking about the hospital. I recently read an article that a number of people, due to the expensive cost of ambulances, are turning to Uber and Lyft when they need to get to the emergency room. On the one hand, the cost of an ambulance is insane. My mom last year had to have emergency brain surgery. She's fine. But the surgery got complicated when she got home. She had to go back to the hospital. She lives in a rural area. So when they discovered that she had an infection, it was in its advanced stages. And like, if they hadn't caught it, like like if it had been a day later, she probably would have died. So they had to get her from her rural home back to the hospital where she originally had surgery, which is about 70 miles away. She had to take an ambulance. Guess how much that cost? Luckily, my parents have insurance. It was like somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000. So, you know, if you're even if you're going like a mile, like when I totaled my 335, the police officer who showed up on the scene asked if, if uh, I needed to go to the hospital. I said, yes. And he said, okay, I'll call you an ambulance. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's, uh, come on, I'll just walk. Luckily, he was nice enough. He gave me a ride to the hospital. But just the staggering cost of an ambulance is enough to dissuade anyone from wanting to go to the ER, let alone if you don't have health insurance and, and you're going to a hospital then. But let's not talk about all that's wrong with this country and the healthcare system. So... I would be basically the ambulance to people sometimes. Generally, it was when people were feeling sick. You know, I would go and I would pick them up and, like, the the destination would be the hospital. And, like, the person who comes out of the house looks like they can barely walk. Like, they look like the definition of somebody who's just, like, dying of illness. So they would get in the car and I would start the trip and I'd see they're going to the hospital and, like, I kind of put two and two together. Like, oh, they're crazy sick. Great. I get to be in a confined space with somebody who might be highly contagious. And then I would drive the entire way there with my sleeve over my nose or something like that. Like, yeah, it's kind of rude, but so is infecting me with whatever it is that you have. I'm sorry that you can't afford an ambulance, but it would... I understand the mentality. I really do. It would just annoy me when I would have to play ambulance to somebody. It's like, this is my vehicle. Like, you're not... I'm not getting paid enough as is. You're probably not going to tip me. And even if you did tip me, I probably wouldn't want that money anyway because it's touching your hands. And after these people would get out, I would always put down, like, all of the windows and I would go over my car with, like, an armor all wipe, just, like, disinfectant. And then I'd practically burn my hands off with sanitizer, just trying to get a little bit clean. Other times, though, I would put my foot down if it was just, like, ridiculous. So trip 5,459 is called Ambulance. And here's the story. I get stuck in like Shakopee or something, one of the far out suburbs. I pick these people up from a nice restaurant in Edina, which borders Minneapolis, and then they're just going, it's my first ride of the of the night, and they're going just straight out to the middle of nowhere. So, I, you know, they're pleasant enough, and they tip me, but like the whole trip, I'm sitting there driving, I'm thinking like, God damn it, I wish I hadn't done this trip, now I'm going to be stuck all night. I drop them off, and then I circle the block, and I find a place to park, and I'm working on my laptop. And maybe about three minutes goes by before the Uber thing beeps. And usually, like I've said so many times, when you end up in the far suburbs, all the rides, because you're the closest driver to everyone both near and far, 
because there's like not any drivers out there, you get all the calls. And most of the calls coming through are like 10 miles away or more because you're the closest driver, like I said. So this one was conspicuously close. It was like two miles away, which is in a suburb like Shakopee or wherever the hell I was. It was, it was like unheard of. So I immediately accept it, and the person's rated five stars, which, as I've also said, is generally a clue that they are a brand new passenger. They are not a five star person. It's just they have not been rated by the system yet. They're not tried and true. So I show up at this bar. It's like it was an area that was probably farmland like ten years ago, and now it's like all these like new trendy bars because like this is like what's happening all over the Minneapolis St. Paul metro, even in the far suburbs. You get these, like, cookie-cutter restaurants and bars and, like, luxury apartments, and they all look the same. So I'm out. I'm waiting in front of this bar, like, waiting directly in front of the bar. Couldn't You couldn't possibly miss me. And the phone rings. And I'm, like, I'm just annoyed because I, you know, I grab the phone. I was like, what? what? What could possibly be your reason for calling me? I, it didn't take me long to get here. I'm here. I've been waiting for a while. There's no way that I could confuse this with someplace else. Like, I am prominently... The only car in front of this bar, there's no need for you to call me. Come out. So I answered the phone, like, yeah, like, what is it? And this woman, I can tell based on her voice, is extremely drunk. She hiccups, like, hey, where, where are your Uber? Where are you? Can you come around the back? And I'm thinking, like, the back? What? Uh, okay, I will, but it seems a little unusual. So I pull off and around, and I go around this alley, like, to the back of, like, it's like kind of a long alley stretch, and it's like where like the reverse side of all these shops and bars are. I use the Uber map to approximate where the reverse side of this restaurant is, because it's like kind of not clear in this alley. And then I text, hey, I'm here. And about a minute goes by, and the back door of this restaurant opens up, and eight people come out. Eight. And they're all walking toward my car, and I realize, oh shit, here's a clown car thing. I'm not going to do this. But then I see they're fucking dragging this girl who's just, like, spewing vomit. Like, this whole group is, like, collectively dragging this girl toward my car. And this girl, like, there's puke everywhere. She's, like, almost, like, projectile just shooting it out of her mouth. And so I realize, oh, my God, these people think that they could turn my car into a transport service for this girl who needs a fucking ambulance. So before they get to my car, I put down my windows and I yell, Hey, you crazy fucks! Your friend doesn't need an Uber! She needs an ambulance! And with that, I put my windows up, and I just ripped off. But, like, you guys should have seen this girl. She was, like, covered in puke. And her friends were, like, getting puke on them because they were, like, carrying her out. But, like, they were – it was strange. They were, like, almost, like, holding her up. It was disgusting. It was unbelievable. And it's one of my many gross Uber stories. So, final thoughts on the ambulance. I guess I came off a little harsh. I, I as a driver, did not like it at all. But I'm also, like, a clean germaphobe freak. So, like, you know, I keep hand sanitizer. I wash my hands all the time. Um, I don't like shaking people's. I mean, I will I will shake someone's hand, but when they're not looking, I will fucking wash my hands, like, immediately afterward. I don't like handling money. I got some germaphobe issues, okay? But just, like, yeah, just the ambulance thing was not my favorite thing to do. It's too bad this country's got such a fucked up health system and just, like, ambulances can't come for everyone when they need them. Instead, people have to be billed an obscene amount of money. Okay, enough talking about the ambulances. In the first episode of Gross, all my stories were inherently gross. It was all stuff that was, like, relating directly to bodily fluids or vomit, what have you. I guess vomit is a bodily fluid. This stuff, and in Gross Part 2 here, I've got a few stories that are a little more benign. But I thought they were gross for one reason or another. So the first one I want to talk about... Trip 850, it's called Dirty Germans. So it's like I'm in downtown Minneapolis. This is way toward the start of my career. I think this is like January of 2015 or something. And I pick up, it's a young couple. It's a man and a woman. They're in like their late 20s. And they're German. They, I don't think they spoke any English. They got in and they said, Hallo, hallo, wie schmeint euch euch? Ich find ein... That's that's what German sounds like to me. It's a combination of a sausage being stuffed down your throat and an angry barking dog. Ich mein weist euch reich und reichstauer! Anyway, back to the right. So these Germans get in and they're speaking German to each other and like, I think the man is fingering the woman. He starts out like, he's like whispering in her ear like, Oh, Fraulein. Ich find ice, Ja, ich 
and she's like, oh, hey, he's in my own shot. And they start kissing and nipping on each other. Like, I'm, they're not going far, but it's starting to set off my misophonia. Well, as we're driving, I start to notice the smell of chocolate. And it gets more and more and more powerful. And finally, it's like, it smells like I'm in a goddamn chocolate factory. And now I'm, I'm pretty confident he's fingering her. So I'm thinking, like, okay, do I just want to throw them out? Do I want to say something? Do they even speak English? Whatever. I think I'll just drive fast instead and get them out as quickly as I can. So I did. And, that I mean, that was that. But it was, it was one of those drives. It was gross. It was funny. It was so strange. But nowhere near as strange as trip 4,806, which is called tax consultation. It's the spring of, I believe, 2016. It's toward the end of the night. I'm going to be wrapping up and going home soon, and I'm in, like, Brooklyn Park. I'm in one of the northern suburbs. I decided I'm going to do one more ride for the night. So it's about 1130, and I roll into this residential driveway. And this woman, there's the door, the front door of the house opens up, and there's three people standing in the doorway. There's two, there's two women and a man. And I see the one, one of the women feverishly makes out with the man. And then she kisses the woman. And then one of the women who's kissed, she's wearing a bathrobe. She comes out to my car. Like, I'm, I'm watching all this. And I think this woman can see that I have seen all that is going on. Because I'm sitting there thinking, like, what the fuck is going on here? And so she comes out and she goes, hey, this is my friend. You're going to be taking her home. Uh, we'll take care of your tip. Just, you know, don't don't drive around in circles once, you, once she gets out of the car. Okay, fine. I'm not going to rip you guys off on this ride. So she goes back in. And then she kisses this woman again. And then this woman, this other woman, comes out of the house and gets in the back seat. And my God, I am staring at the most dried up hooker in the state of Minnesota, by far. And this woman, even the way she talks, it's like the only thing that has entered her mouth, maybe ever, are cigarettes and dick. Hey, sugar. Oh, what a wild ride that was. She's like, this woman is not even trying to hide the fact that she is a prostitute and that she just hooked up with this married couple, like... I don't, maybe she was on the behest of like a marriage counselor or I don't know how this woman, maybe these two are swingers. I don't know what the deal is, but this woman is blatantly a hooker. And like, as we're driving, she goes, so, uh, uh, let me ask you something. How's this business work? And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, how do you do your taxes? I'm like, um, okay, well, I'm, I'm an independent contractor, so I just hold on to all my receipts, and at the end of the year, I'm able to write everything off because I'm technically my own company here. So I write off my miles, I write off my gas, I write off my depreciation on my vehicle. Pretty much everything you can think of that happens to me on the road, if it's a financial incurrence, I save the record, and then I write it off. And then she goes, okay, well, how do the paychecks work? And I go, okay, well, I, I get, I get a, you know, it's like a regular job. I get... A weekly paycheck from Uber and a weekly paycheck from Lyft because I do them both. Uber pays on Wednesday. Lyft pays on Thursday. Why are you asking me this? And she goes, well, see, here's my situation. I'm in a cash-only business. Maybe it's kind of similar to this here. So I've been looking, thinking, how am I going to be doing my taxes? Because, you know, I can't exactly check sex worker. (laughs) So now I'm thinking, like, there, there, there's a prostitute in my back seat asking me for tax advice. Why does, she, why does this woman think that me, her Uber driver, is qualified to be telling her how to hide her sex money? She shows me all the money she made from this trip, and it's like, it's a pile of money, but it's mostly like fives and ones, and she's like, yeah, I just pocketed 230 from those two in there, and the night is only young. And I, like, I just, I have to know, because I'm looking at her in the face, and she, like, she looks like an old woman. She reminds me of the monster from room 237 in The Shining. That's what this woman looks like. Not the pretty version, the demon version. And so if I I've straight up asked her, I go, how old are you? She goes, 45. And I'm thinking, like, oh, God, going on 69. And then I asked her, I go, how long have you been in this business? Because I'm thinking she was going to say, like, since I was a little girl. She goes... Oh, about three years. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. You got that chewed up and spit out in three short years, lady? Meanwhile, as she's waiting for a reply, she puts down the window and goes, 
and just hawks the most disgusting loogie I've ever heard anyone hawk out the window. I cringe and just mutter, oh, Jesus Christ. I finally just said to her, my advice to you would be to save your receipts, form a corporation of some kind, make an LLC. It's easy to do. You can do it online. It only costs about $120. And then get an accountant. She goes, oh, do you think I could have your accountant? Could you give me his number? And I'm thinking, like, if you think I'm burning bridges with my accountant, you have another thing coming, lady. I could just imagine that phone call. Evan, why did you send me a hooker? What makes you think I want a hooker's business? Anyway, sometimes some of the grossest things that I would encounter as a driver wasn't what I would see. It was what I would smell. So I've talked about motel room riders where uh, they treat your car like a Motel 6. They hook up. They light a cigarette, they think it's a good spot where they can eat, or worse, locker room riders who have terrible B.O., they smell like they just came from the gym, or like, they basically treat your car like a locker room, they'll change in it, but by and large, I think the worst was the food. Not only, and as I've said countless times, the misophonia, the sound of chewing is like nails on a chalkboard for me, it's actually probably the worst sound in the world, you know, sorry to anybody listening to this who has misophonia. That was probably awful for you to hear. To me, it always seemed like a common sense kind of thing. I would never eat in an Uber. I mean, not only one, is it disgusting because there's people getting in and out. And there's like, whenever I get in an Uber, I like I hesitantly get in because I just think about like all the asses that have been in the seat where I'm sitting. And the fact that the driver probably does not clean the car that often. So putting things into my mouth, using my hands to do that in an already germy space, it doesn't seem very appealing to me. Not to mention a lot of Ubers have, like, weird odors. I pride myself in saying that my car never smelled because I had it cleaned all the time. But I've been in I've been in far too many Ubers that have uh, the public transit smell, let's just say. So it would never occur to me to eat in an Uber. And when other people would do it, if they weren't drunk, it always kind of left me mystified. Like, I remember I had this one kid who was probably, like, 17, And he was using Uber to go from, like, Roseville to Uptown. So kind of a long distance. And about five minutes into the drive, this kid goes, Hey, can I eat my lunch in here? And, like, I I looked at him, and I said yes, but I said it in a way that was like, yeah. Like, passive-aggressively, Minnesota. It's a Minnesota way of saying no. But this kid didn't pick up on the hint. And he started eating his food. And it was the smelliest garbage. I don't know what the fuck this kid was eating. It wasn't even fast food. He brought it from home. But the car smelled the high heaven after he got out. I had to put all the windows down. It still smelled. It smelled for like an hour. So later on this night in Uptown, when I was out and about walking around, I saw this kid. And I stopped in the street because he's walking toward me. And I just stared at him. And I gave him like the craziest death glare. But I'm pretty sure this kid forgot what I looked like. Because like he saw me. But I could see in his eyes that he didn't register or recognize me. And I remain frozen just standing there watching this kid go by. And so he walks past me, like, kind of looking at me like, what's this dude's problem? And I just mutter, smelly little bastard. Needless to say, I issued that kid a bad rating. But the worst I would encounter from food was trip 1,748 called Big Bucks at the Bell. I picked up these drunk college students. It was like, I picked them up in Uptown. I think I picked them up in Uptown. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm driving them back to campus and somebody says they want fast food, and we have to go on a fast food run. So there's one Taco Bell that's open by the University of Minnesota. It's the only restaurant or, like, the only fast food place nearby I could think of that was open. There's three people in my car. We get in line at Taco Bell. Person one orders about $12 worth of food. Person two orders about $20 worth of food. And person three orders about $20 worth of food. So there was, like, it was like almost $60 of Taco Bell that these kids, these drunk drunk kids bought and of course they proceeded to eat most of it in my car so after they got out the car reeked of taco bell for the rest of the night i had all the windows down and the smell would not go away i had to have the car professionally clean the next day which segues us to our sponsor this episode of the ubered podcast is brought to you by taco bell taco bell let's put your insides on the outside i'm sure taco bell corporate is gonna love that one anyway back to the story Also, this story contains one of my favorite descriptions I used in Uber, the one that I came under fire for using. I remarked that one of the girls looked like she couldn't even swallow cum, let alone this heaping platter of diabetes. What an awful 
misogynistic, horrible thing to say about a young woman. Okay, if you would have seen this drunk troll shoving that sawdust down her throat like a goat at the city dump, you'd say mean things about her too. Especially when that bitch stunk up my car for a day after. When they got out, I was just thinking like, really? You couldn't have waited to get home? You had to eat it in the back seat? It was like enough to make me nauseous. But interestingly, and segueing along here, you know what doesn't make me nauseous? Witnessing somebody vomit. So, I don't know what the science behind it is. I guess I, could, I have my computer in front of me. I could probably look it up in three seconds, but I'm not going to. When you watch somebody puke, when you witness somebody do the act, it's kind of like watching somebody yawn. It spawns uncontrollable mimicry. Like, it just, you see somebody puke, you yourself want to puke. It's like a natural human reaction. But, if you attend a fraternity in college, you witness a lot of puke. And, well, for me at least, I'm totally, totally desensitized to puking. It does not bother me in the least bit. I'm sure throughout the course of rideshare history, and on probably more than one occasion, I could just picture this disgusting scene. Somebody in the back seat pukes, and the smell and the sound and the act, or whatever, it forces the driver to puke, too. So, passenger puke and a driver puke. Just picture that. The only thing that really got me, minus the sound of chewing was uh feces i've got two stories for you there so the first one it was in a marathon night or it was in a night in uber 2 where so much happened in one night instead of writing about the one trip i just wrote about the whole night and i wrote about all the trips in the night so this was toward the start of the night it was one of the first rides it was a saturday evening it was around seven or eight or so and i picked up a couple a man and a woman from the acme comedy club downtown and the man was fine, but the woman was shit-faced drunk. And she's, like, like mumbling nothings to herself as the guy loads her up in the car. So he buckles her seatbelt, and he's making pleasant conversation with me. They're going to their home in St. Louis Park. And the woman is also trying to jump in on this conversation, but she's so goddamn drunk and belligerent that, like, like it's just like she's rambling nothings. So as we're driving... She randomly decides to start getting combative with me, and, like, the husband is trying to be like, okay, you are out of control. We had, I pieced together, just kind of threw over here in their conversation. They had to leave the comedy club because this woman is so drunk, she, uh, I guess she stood up and started, like, heckling the comedian, but just ended up embarrassing herself, and, like, he had to, like, get her out of there. So he's on his phone texting, and she goes, who are you texting? And he goes... Uh, your mom. We're going to be having a serious talk tomorrow. And so she gets all smart with him. It's like, uh, uh, whatever. I don't uh, fucking need uh, you or my mom. Fuck uh, both of you. Hey, uh, driver, uh, why, why are you going this way? Do you even know where you're going? And so this kicks off a fight because the dude jumps up to my, jumps to my defense and is like, okay, you need to just let him do his job. He knows what he's doing. You're really drunk. You're being very rude. I don't want my score to go down. And so I, you know, I kind of mentioned to this guy, I'm treating her like she's not even there because she's not going to remember any of this. So I just go, oh, dude, it's okay. Trust me. I've seen a lot worse. And so somehow her inebriated brain processes that I'm making fun of her. She's like, excuse me. Fuck you. Fuck this asshole. He's not getting paid for this trip. He's not getting a dime. And I used to, this is a thing that would happen kind of a lot where I would be driving two people. One of them would be belligerently drunk and the other one wouldn't be. And the one who's belligerently drunk picks a fight with me and then tries to tell me, even though they're not paying for the ride, they try to tell me that I'm not getting paid and I'm not getting a tip either, even though they have no power over this whatsoever. And they are always so sure of themselves. And they think like, oh, yeah, I just fucking got him. He's not getting paid, even though I'm not even buying the ride and I'm just a drunk idiot. So luckily, I don't have to listen to this for long because in attempting to berate me, again, the man jumps to my defense and is like, you know, trying to direct his drunk wife or his girlfriend or whoever this woman is, like, onto him and not onto me. And so somewhere, maybe about five minutes to go in this ride, she farts. But, I mean, she didn't just fart. It was like she ate a skunk soaked in mercury and radiation and shat it out in her pants. It was actually... One of the worst things I've ever smelled. My face curdled, and I couldn't help but react. I think I said something along the lines of, Jesus fucking Christ, or something like that. And so then he said it to me. He's like, oh, my God. And this woman's name is Trish. I learned her name. Oh, my God, Trish, did you fart? And I'm thinking, like, fart? 
No, she shat her pants. She had to have. So, despite the fact that it was disgusting and I now have my nose buried in my shirt, I'm laughing because, like, it's it's funny. And so me laughing at her pisses her off even worse. And she's like, are you fucking serious right now? This guy's laughing at me? It's like, yeah, I am laughing at you. You just shat your pants, you drunk mess. The rest of the ride is her, like, attempting to insult me, but she doesn't she doesn't possess the cognition to do it anymore. It's just like incoherent sounds coming out of her mouth that are like half formed insults. Meanwhile, he's trying to calm her down and keep her quiet and keep his score intact. So we get to their house and she fumbles getting out of the car. And the only thing she's saying is zero stars. You're not getting a dime, you jackass. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, oh, Trish, you don't need to pay me. You've already tipped me in a great story. I had to get one final word, and I lean back just before the door closed. I go, hey, do you spell that Trish or Trisha? Hinting I was going to write about her. Of course, she didn't get it, but put a smile on my face. And if she did shit her pants, I never confirmed if she did or not. I suspect she did, but nothing got on my seat. I washed it off anyway, but like it was fine. But on trip 7,186, they did leave a mark. So on this night... It's just about bar close, and I haven't made very much for the night. So when I stopped doing Uber full-time, I just transferred to doing it mainly on the weekends. And I would do like Friday night and Saturday night. And the rule of thumb was make about $100 each night. I wouldn't do it for very long. I would start at about 10 p.m. And because Uber and Lyft would always have bonus quests, it made it just a little bit easier. You'd have to get like seven or eight rides, but... Within that, you could usually, between the bonus and the surges and everything else, you could usually get your $100 mark. But sometimes you would just get screwed and, like, you just wouldn't make the money you thought you had. So on this night, I'd made about 50 bucks and I had been at it for about five hours, so I wasn't too happy. Well, I decide I'm not going to do the downtown Minneapolis pickup because it's just, as I've, as I've said in this podcast, it's such a fucking headache to deal with downtown Minneapolis drunks at bar clothes. So I'm instead going to go to northeast Minneapolis. I'm sitting in my car. I'm waiting for the surge prices to hit a certain number. I'm only doing Uber. I haven't done Lyft at all this night. And so I see two. I pass on two times the rate. I pass on three times the rate. And at three and a half times the rate, I decide to take a ride. So I select the guy's name is Patrick, and he's calling from just down the street at the Bulldog Northeast. So I arrive, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. It's like 2.15, so the bars have been out for about 15 minutes now. And I'm watching people coming and going, getting into Ubers, and most people are really fucking drunk, I'm noticing. that. Are... So like certain nights at bar close, it seems like kind of everybody's on the same page. Either everybody's being well-behaved and has been for the whole night. Or everybody's just three sheets to the wind drunk. So this was one of those nights. It's been maybe three minutes. And so now I'm kind of looking around. And I text the person, Patrick, and he doesn't text me back. And I look behind in my rear view mirror and I see two people coming to my car. It's a man and a woman. And the man is like practically carrying the woman. And right away I say out loud to myself, that right there is a puker if I've ever seen one. And so then I have the little mental debate. Do I want to deal with cleaning up vomit? Well, yes, I do, because I haven't made very much money tonight, and really, this is going to be the only way to enjoy profitability this evening. So I sit, and I wait, and I unlock the doors, and I decide that I'm going to go down this path. Well, the door opens up, and the first words in the car are, Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! And so it's like I'm suddenly privy to the scene of, like, an emergency room. Like, this guy deposits this woman in the seat behind me, and he's freaking out because this lady is so drunk, her eyes are rolled back in her head, She's got drool coming down. Like, she looks like she's about to die. Like, she's, like, having, like, a heroin overdose. And so he jumps in behind me, and I turn around. I'm like, is she going to be okay? Like, does she need to go to the hospital? And the guy just, he turns to me and he says, what we need right now is haste. Get us home as quick as you can. So, okay. So I start the trip, and I start driving, and they're heading to Uptown. They're, like, they're on my way home, so this is kind of perfect. So we don't even get very far. Maybe about a mile. And this guy's like comfort comforting her and trying to like keep her lucid. And then I just hear, it sounds like a waterfall, like the distinct sound of puke. And so really what I'm hearing is cha-ching, like the sound of like a cash register opening up. And because it's an expensive ride, I want to keep it going as long as I can. So I pulled over and I went and I got the door for her. And she just pukes on the side of the road on University Avenue. And I'm leaning up against my car, 
like waving to cars passing by us, and just smiling, thinking like, "Oh, Evan's getting paid. Evan's getting paid. Yeah, it's a little growth, but it's all in a day's work." That was my song getting paid. And if you thought that was good, just wait till the remix. Anyway, so she pukes her fucking brains out all over the ground, and I, <laughs> I'm like, I am laughing at this point. And so Patrick goes, oh, man, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not as sorry as you're going to be. Well, she finishes. I'm not even going to bother cleaning. I'll clean it up when I get home. I close the door. I get back in the car, and we start driving again. And I hear maybe about just before we turn down to Highway 35. So still, we have yet to go. We have yet to go two miles. And I hear him go, you know, like sniffing. And he goes, oh, my God, Beth. Did you just shit your pants? So he goes on to explain to me that this woman is like a diabetic and she doesn't drink very much. And, and I guess tonight she she let loose. But she fucking shit herself in my car after puking. It's like body fluid bingo we're playing here. Well, I was fine keeping the trip nice and slow at first, even with the smell of puke. But once you, once you mix the smell of feces in that, now I'm driving fast. Now I want to get this, this ride over with as quick as I can. So speed to their house, and finally I get them out, and this guy, you know, he's apologizing. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And it's like, okay, you know what? Just save it. You've, like, destroyed the back of my car. Right as he is unloading her, the song Get the Money by Panty Raid comes on. And it was, like, it was like the most perfect timing. So I watched, like, I watched him drag her into the house, and I just sit there with the meter running for – I got all the windows down now because, like, I, there's no way I can be in the car with this smell. So I let the song play out, and I just sit there with the windows down. I let another song play out, and then I ended the trip. And then I, well, I rated him one star just to maximize my claim for a fine. Snapped a photo, and by the time I got home, I was $150 richer. But my God, that car, that car took about an hour for me to clean out. I had to clean it out by hand, and then I went and got it professionally clean the next day on top. But I had to, I had to pound three beers and smoke two spliffs. Just to coach myself through cleaning that out because she puked in the side panel in the door and she basically filled up the cubby with puke. All right, listeners, since we are going to be playing body fluid bingo now, I've got two more stories for you to complete the line. This next one is a puke story. It's trip 6,899 and it's called Fallout Boy. As you all might remember in episode eight, it was called I Hate You. And I vented about St. Thomas students. St. Thomas is a private college in St. Paul, and probably one in two St. Thomas students that I would drive, maybe even three in four, would piss me off in some way. Usually they were drunk. There were a few bars in St. Paul that these kids would go to. The Wild Onion and Plums were two of the biggest ones. And so whenever I would go to these, these bars for pickups, what I would see outside of them was usually disgusting in its own right. Like, you pull up and somebody comes stumbling out of the bar and just blast vomit everywhere and then like falls face down in their own puke or i would see fights or drama with drunk college students or screaming girls or like never ever a pretty pickup at plums or the wild onions so when i'm driving to the wild onion on this night and it's just about midnight or so i'm thinking okay i know what i'm probably going to be getting into but it's a one and a half times the rate ride, and the kid's probably just going back to the campus. So I'm earning $5 to deal with bullshit for five minutes. That's fine. Well, of course, the kid takes five minutes to come out, and when he gets in the car, I start the trip, and I see he's going to fucking Egan. So I'm going straight south 15 miles, and once I'm in Egan, again, I'm going to be stuck. Like, there's no way in hell anybody's going to be going back to the city. So this is a ride that I wish I hadn't accepted. It's off to a bad start. Just as he gets in the car. Well, we drive maybe three minutes, and I have GPS. Like, I don't need help. I know where I'm going. Well, this kid is trying to drunk direct me, and so I start, I'm listening to him at first, even though, like, the way he's going is stupid, and he leads us in a big circle. And then he gets confused and bewildered as to why we went in a circle, and I look at him, I go, kid, I got this. You're drunk. I have navigation. I don't need your help. Just be quiet and let me do my job. So the kid gets a little bitter. And, like, I don't hear anything from him, and I drive in silence for about a minute. And I look over, and the kid has passed out. Well, as you can imagine, the drive vastly improved once he passed out. I got us on the highway. I'm enjoying myself and listening to music that I want to listen to. Because, like I said, this kid has passed out, so he doesn't get a say in anything. He's just going to be quiet, and I'll wake him up when we get there. Well, fast forward about 15 minutes. We're on the highway in Egan, 
heading toward, I think we're going to this kid's parents' house. Well, this kid wakes up, like, with a hiccup, and he looks around, and he's like, what? Where the fuck are we? Why did you take this way? And then he hiccups and he starts dry heaving. And this is right as we are turning off of one highway onto another. So I'm on a cloverleaf exit here. So this kid starts dry heaving and he opens the door to puke, but he's not wearing his seatbelt and he's fucking drunk. And so as I'm on the cloverleaf turning, I hear the door open and I look and I see this kid go to lean out and start puking. But he almost falls out of the moving car, and I have to reach over and grab him by the back of his shirt to hold him in the car. So I'm steering off this cloverleaf with both knees. I can drive with my knees. It's not something I do very often, but I am quite good at it. I'm steering with my goddamn knees, holding this kid as he's just blasting vomit, holding him as tight as I can, hoping to hell that his shirt doesn't rip so he doesn't fall out of the car and I run over and kill him. As soon as we get off the clover leaf, I quickly pull over because, like, there's no shoulder on a clover leaf, so, like, he can't pull over. Pull over on the side of the highway, and I go to grab a bag, like, because I had, at this time, I had vomit bags. I would eventually get rid of the vomit bags because I wanted people to puke for the fine because I got paid more for that. So, but this time, I've got the bag. So I go running over to his side, and I hand him the bag, and he's, like, he's finished puking by now. And he's, like, he's not gotten a lot, but he's gotten some spattered on the door and a little bit on the seat. Well, he, yeah, I give him the, I give him the bag and he like just passes right back out, like boom, out like a light. So like, I'm just like looking at the scene, like kind of annoying, like God, fucking damn it, this stupid kid. Close the door, get back in the car, keep driving. We arrive at his house or his parents' house and we pull into the driveway. And right as we pull into the driveway, I wake him up and he looks around. He's like, oh, uh, what the fuck, man? He looks at me like, like he's mad at me. He goes, what the fuck? What's with this? And he looks down at the bag that I left him, the puke bag on his lap. What's with this fucking bag? And he takes the bag and he just goes, are you the worst Uber driver ever? And he like, like throws, he doesn't throw it, but he like kind of like tosses it like on my lap as like a fuck you. And he gets out of the car without saying thank you and just goes into the house. And I'm just sitting there stewing in utter disbelief that this drunk asshole could be so fucking rude and so ungrateful and also, like, just have no idea what just happened. I literally saved this kid's life, and he fucking didn't recognize it at all. And he puked in my car, and he was ungrateful for everything. So I hit him with the fine. Uh, I went to a nearby gas station. I cleaned out all the puke. It wasn't that bad. I was able to keep giving rides. Usually when somebody would puke, it would shut me down for the night because of the smell. It just wouldn't go away. But this kid, I mean, really, I probably wouldn't. Actually, no, I would have fined him. <laughs> I, was say, I probably wouldn't have found him. Yeah, I would have found him anyway. But the smell wasn't that severe. So once I cleaned the car out, I was able to keep going that night. Okay, listeners, one final story. And it doesn't even have a title because I never wrote about it. This story happened. This is like one of the last things to happen to me as an Uber driver. One of the final weeks that I was driving. So the story goes, it's bar close and I am outside of the Target Center. The Target Center was like the best place to wait if you're doing a downtown Minneapolis pickup. Because, as I mentioned, the police block off large portions of the downtown to protect people because they leap out like fucking deer when they're drunk. And, like, all kinds of crazy shit happens at bar clothes in downtown Minneapolis. So it's for the good of the public. They block off the streets, or at least that's what they say. But the problem is I have to find an alternative place because most of these calls coming through are from behind the barricade. An alternative place for my passenger to meet me. And this is a person that's been drinking all night. So getting them to my car is never easy. Well, Target Center like is like the best spot for waiting in a stress-free place where like I'm probably not going to see any crazy shit. And generally, people can find me because the Target Center is a pretty prominent landmark in downtown. Well, I'm waiting and I'm waiting for these people. It's like 2.15. So bar- the bars have been out for like 15 minutes now. Finally, I call them. They say we're on the way. And they always say, again, I'm at the Target Center. I'm not at the place that you need. You wanted me to pick you up at. Okay, fine. We're coming. I can tell this guy is drunk on the phone. So I start the meter because I'm going to be, like I said, waiting there. It's three times the rate ride, so I was getting paid shit for time on the regular rates, but when it it was surge, then waiting the time, that adds up in a good way for me. So they're going to St. Louis Park. It's like, I'll probably make like 40 bucks off of this ride. Well, the people in question come. It's four men. They're all drunk, and one of them is like the fucking drunkest dude I think I've ever seen ever. This guy, his shirt is ripped. He's missing a shoe. His eyes, he's so drunk when he gets in the car, his eyes are, are cross-eyed, literally cross-eyed, and he's bleeding from the nose. 
So it looks like he got into, like, a fight or something. Like, this dude just, he's so drunk, he has, like, no idea what's going on. He's, like, not puking yet. But his friends help him in the car, and they get in, like, they're all really drunk, too. So they, they start trying to talk to me, and, like, they're just a bunch of bros, and I don't want to talk to them. They pick up in that pretty quick. They leave me alone. Well, finally, we get to this house in St. Louis Park, and they're unloading from the car. And as I look back, I see they have sweat all over my seats. Like, my seats are, like, actually wet. And so, like, I like the one guy who bought the ride sees me touching it, like, inspecting it, like, and he goes, bro, don't you find me. And, like, that's all he says, and he's walking away. And I'm thinking, like, okay, one, I'm going to be the judge of that. Two, you probably should have tipped me. If you ever want a driver not to find you, tip them and tip them well. Usually they won't. So I'm thinking, like, I'm not going to find them at first. Like, it's not, they haven't really damaged the car. But I'm driving down the block, and there's, like, kind of a weird smell. And so I pull over, and I turn on the cabin lights. And this dude, who was, like, a train wreck, has bled like a pig all over my floor mat. I think what would happen was like he was like leaning between like his legs, so the blood from his face just dripped down on my floor mat. And like I had like a weatherproof mat, so it's not like he like ruined it. But there's so much blood, and like I pulled over in this random uh, out front of this random house where like the sprinklers were going, and so I took the mat out of the car and I took a picture of it, and I just put it in the sprinkler and I washed it off. And I'm thinking to myself like, okay, is the car destroyed? No. But if you are going to bleed all over my car, like, like I've never cleaned up blood before. If I'm cleaning up your blood, fuck you. You're getting the fine. Sometimes it brought me particular pleasure imagining the facial expression of the person when they see the next day that I find them. Because sometimes, you know, like I said, with Fallout Boy or like with this guy, they were just really rude to me. So, you know, it's kind of like, huh, I got the last laugh there, asshole. But listeners, that's going to do it for this edition of the Ubered podcast. This has been Gross Part 2. I won't do another gross. I think I've grossed you all out enough. As always, I'll remind everyone, check out my three books, Ubered, My Life as a Rideshare Driver, Uber 2, and Wolf in the Jungle. They're all on Amazon. If you live in the Twin Cities area, the Hennepin County Library is carrying all three of my books. I'm also on social media, at Evan Kale, and on Twitter, at Evan Kale, and at Ubered Books. And also, I'm going to be doing a Q&A on the final episode of the Ubered podcast. So direct message or tweet your questions at me or use the hashtag Ubered podcast that I'll answer them in the last episode. Listeners, you have been Ubered. I'm Evan Kale, signing off.